Open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. If you've been here for a few weeks, then you know that we've been studying Galatians. Uh, we've been kind of doing half chapters at a time. So today we're going to finish chapter 2. And when you get to Galatians, just real loud say, Amen. Ah, oh, great. All right, so Galatians chapter 2. We'll be starting in verse 11, and we'll be finishing the chapter. Um, if you didn't know this, Galatians is really easily and quite perfectly divided into three portions. The first two chapters, then chapters 3 and 4, and lastly, chapters 5 and 6. It, it almost outlines itself. It makes my job a little easier. But one commentator said this, and it'll be up on the slide for you. He said, thus the epistle falls into three sections of two chapters each. The first is personal. The second is doctrinal. The third is practical. The first concerns Paul's divine commission. The second, his doctrine of freedom from the law. And the third, the life of the believers. The first presents the apostle of liberty. The second, the doctrine of liberty. And third, the life of liberty. So you can see there, or you can hear there, that immediately the focus of these opening two chapters is Paul, an apostle called by God, right? He even opens up the very first verse of the book, Paul, an apostle, not by men nor through men, but by Jesus Christ and his father who raised him from the dead. That's how the book opens up. So today we're going to finish that first portion of the book, the first two chapters, and we're going to look at Paul's personal, who, who he was, uh, his divine commission, and we're going to see a little bit more about his emphasis and his calling to preach the word straight and true. So, this first section, Paul has established his credibility. He opens up the book by saying he was called by Christ, not by men, nor through men, but by Christ alone. Then he moves on in the second half of chapter 1 to talk about his transformation, that not only was he called by Christ, but he was changed by Christ. And he can prove his apostleship by the very fact that he is a new man. That even though he used to persecute people and put them out and try to imprison them, now he was preaching the gospel that he had once attacked. So his transformation proved it. And in the first part of chapter 2, we talked about last week the council. When all the apostles from Jerusalem and from Antioch, they all got together, they all agreed in one mind and in one accord, that they were saved by grace through faith. Nothing else. The law was extra. The law was behind them now. So Paul was credible because he was in unity with the rest of the apostles. And today we're going to finish chapter 2 where Paul finishes the defense of his apostleship by relating his public rebuke of Peter when Peter wasn't living by the truth, and it takes the opportunity as well to again address the salvation we share by grace through faith. This public rebuke of Peter, what Peter was doing, and how Paul had to come and talk to him about it, it was the perfect vehicle for Paul to finish up his uh, credibility as an apostle because he had to correct another apostle. It also was the perfect vehicle to drive home the same point. Again, we are saved by grace through faith, nothing else. So he takes that opportunity. It illustrates the worthlessness of the law when you are living by grace. You can't have one and the other. We were saved by grace. It illustrates the lack of hope trying to get justified or to declare be declared righteous or to be saved by living by the law. It was only ever supposed to be by grace. But as a church, we've spent the last three weeks talking about that. We have spent the last three weeks talking about that. And if you have been a Christian for any length of time, you probably know that you're saved by grace through faith. And so as we go through this rebuke of Paul talking to Peter, and addressing him, we're going to learn something a little more pointed for us as a church instead of reteaching what I taught last week. I'm going to see, we are going to see something that's there, and we're going to highlight it and pinpoint it, 
And it's really the idea of the fear of man versus the fear of God. And so I'm going to ask you guys today to really be thinking about, do you fear man and place your faith in man and live to get approval by people and the men or the women around you, maybe your parents, maybe your siblings, maybe your pastor or your priest or whoever you used to live for, or do you live for God's approval? It's a personal question. It's an individual question. You have to think about it yourself. Have you placed your faith in Jesus? And do you seek his stamp? Or are you still waiting for someone to come along and say that, yeah, I believe you're saved, or I think you're a good person? It really has to only be by Jesus. So let's read chapter 2, verse 11. It says, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I, Paul, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. Verse 18. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live, excuse me, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Let's pray. Father, as we study your word and we understand your word, Lord, we pray that it would be the work of the Holy Spirit to teach us to minister to us, Lord, encouragement to those who are discouraged, instruction to those who need direction, and conviction to those who might be compromised in their walk or who are in sin. Lord, may we learn what it means to fear you and you alone. In your name we pray. Amen. So it opens up, verse 11, Peter coming to Antioch. He came to Antioch to visit the Christians there. Now, we don't know exactly when this happened. Um, there's a couple different interpretations, but the most accepted, the most uh, well-known is that if you follow Paul's epistle in Galatians chronologically, he talks about how he was called, and then he was transformed, and then how he met with the apostles once, and then a second time, and now a visit from Peter. So it only makes sense that he would keep going chronologically, and so this would be after they had all already agreed that it was only by grace we are saved. Peter comes to Antioch. He already knew the truth, but yet he didn't live by the truth when push came to shove. He had a moment of weakness. He had a moment of failure. And so Paul rebukes him. We notice in verse 11 that he came to Antioch. Antioch is was, excuse me, was the center of the Gentile church. That's where it was heavily populated with non-Jews, the Gentiles, and the church was growing and bustling and just developing, but most of the converts were Gentiles who were coming to believe in Jesus. And Paul, his missionary trips were based out of Antioch. That's where him and Barnabas were called aside to go out. And so Paul was really well known there and he knew the people there. In fact, he would probably have said that that was his home church, that that was his city. 
Verse 11 says that Paul came and withstood him to the face. He came and he withstood him to the face. It wasn't a backbiting, slanderous Paul the Apostle. It was a confrontational, out of love, I need to talk to you one-on-one about what's going on. He needed to talk to him in person. So I would encourage you guys, as a side note for our church, never, never, never let yourself get caught up in gossip. Never let yourself get caught up in slander and defacing and talking about someone else's sin behind their back. Because if you really cared about them, you would pray for them, and then you would go and approach them and help them. You wouldn't backbite. You wouldn't slander. You wouldn't stab them in the back. And it says that Paul, in verse 14, which we already read, I'm kind of jumping a little ahead, but it's just to set the setting. It says that he withstood him before them all. He withstood them before them all. It was a big issue. It was something so important that it couldn't just be one-on-one because Peter's actions were affecting the people around him, and Peter's actions were leading other people into sin, and the whole church was being affected. So he had to do it in person in front of other people. It couldn't be a secret. Now, most times, I'm going to say 90% of the time, 95%, 99% probably, if someone's in sin and you have something to do with it and you want to approach them, it should be one-on-one. In fact, Jesus gave us that um, uh, model that you approach them one-on-one and then you bring another person if they didn't agree. And then finally, after two or three, then you bring in the leadership. Then it's something to be brought up because you are responsible for loving your brother. Not, you don't come to Pastor Alejandro and say, hey, you need to talk to that guy. No, no, you, out of love, reach out to them. Pray for them. And if they don't listen, then you can come talk to me, right? I don't want to have to know everybody's, you know, dirty laundry. I'd rather know later on that they had confessed their sin and they were won over by their brother or their sister. That at women's group at the, or at men's group, somebody said something and they were able to fix it together. I don't have to know everything. <laughs> but we see here... Peter's mistake was that he was eating with the Gentiles for a while, and then when other people came, the Judaizers that we've been talking about, these people who were of the circumcision, they were forcing people to live by the law, that's when he stopped eating with the Gentiles, and he started eating with only the Jews. He was going back on his own decision, going back on his own word. You're probably wondering, why is that a big deal? (laughs) Well, The Jews had very specific kosher dietary laws, right? If you've read the law of Deuteronomy or of Leviticus, you'll see that it's just over and over. You can't eat this, you shall eat that. You can't eat this, you shall eat that. And why? One, for their safety. Some of those things we know now in modern world that they have to be cooked right. And so if they had cooked it wrong, God was watching out for them. He was saying, don't eat that because you'll die if you don't cook it right. They didn't have the tools we had. Secondly, God also put those rules in place to show them the difference between cleanliness and unclean, something that's holy and unholy. It was so that they could understand a spiritual lesson because eating bacon really doesn't affect you. I mean, it does, but it it doesn't affect you spiritually, right? So Peter was disagreeing with his own kosher laws. Also, The Jewish custom was that if you eat with someone, you're family with that person. You're one with that person. It's kind of like when we have a church potluck, everybody gets together, everybody's excited, everybody's enjoying it. You sense that feeling of family in the church, right? You sense that feeling of community. When you go out with your friend for coffee and you just share a moment together, and you feel like you're connected, right? So Peter was eating the wrong food with the wrong people and in the wrong city as a Jew. That was his mistake. He was wrong on three points. He was messed up in the Jewish law. But Peter knew better. Do you guys remember in Acts when Peter was praying and he had a vision from the Lord that God showed him and spoke to him and said, Peter, go kill and eat. You're allowed now. You're saved by grace. Go eat whatever you want. And Peter said, no, not so, Lord, right? He had this issue for a while. He, he responded negatively to God. And then Peter said, the Lord spoke to Peter, and he finally got it. And then in the following day or two, Peter was also led by God to the house of Cornelius to meet with Gentiles and to enter a Gentile home, which was a no-no as a Jewish person. And he preached the gospel to them, and they received it, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Peter, in a matter of days, and this would have been years prior to this moment, knew and was show, shown by God that he could eat whatever he wanted and he could spend time with whoever he wanted because we were saved by grace and not by the law. But that didn't mean that he didn't fall prey to peer pressure and the influence of others, right? The fear of man started affecting him. Now, these kinds of laws and rules of what you could eat and couldn't and who to spend time with and the Gentiles versus the Jews, those also, unfortunately, were twisted and manipulated to be the backbone of Jewish racism, that we're the God's chosen people and the rest of the world can burn. They didn't care. They were selfish. They were holding on to God on their own. They were privileged to be raised in a culture that worshiped the one true God, but they didn't share that like they should have. As a Christian, as a church, our heart is that we would take the privilege of knowing God and then share him with others. We never hold Jesus to ourselves. We always want other people to meet him, to know him, to love him like we do. But those laws were used falsely, and even now they were being trying to be reintroduced into Peter's life. And so I'm going to call these the tragedies of fearing man. The first tragedy of fearing man rather than fearing God is the loss of liberty. Peter knew he could eat whatever he wanted. Peter knew he could spend time with whoever he wanted because it was the love of Christ that brought unity to them. He knew this, but yet because he was afraid of people and their approval, he lost his own liberties. He lost his own liberties. Now, there is a time and place to set aside a Christian liberty for the benefit of somebody else, somebody who's weaker in the faith and doesn't understand that some things actually aren't sin. We just have to be wise with them. And then there are other times where it's sin and you need to get it out of your life, right? This time, Peter wasn't setting it aside for people's benefit. He was setting it aside because he was afraid, and because he wanted to find approval in these people's eyes, because he was trying to please or honor them by doing what they wanted out of him. When you fear man rather than fearing God, you'll lose some of your liberties. You'll lose some of the privileges as a Christian. Whether it's a bad minister who tells you that if you look like that or you dress that way, you're not welcome here. Or if it's a mom and dad or brother and sister, whoever it is, trying to encourage you to be holy, but be holy by doing this or not doing this. Eating that versus not eating that. Celebrate this holiday versus not celebrating that holiday. Eventually, you're, you're going to lose freedom. And you'll lose it to the people that you fear. Look at verse 12. It says, For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. From James. These men came from James. Now, James was a part of that council that agreed that we were saved by grace and that the law could be set aside. So when they came from James, it's implying this idea that they came trying to represent James. They came trying to have the authority of, well, we know what James would say if he was here, but that's not true at all. They came trying to pull, pull this facade of authority or of repre representing an apostle. They came from Jerusalem where James lived, and so they came with the whole culture of the center of the Jewish Christian faith. And when they showed up to Antioch, showed up to Antioch they came trying to cause issues. These legalists were flaunting authority that they didn't have with the commission that James never gave them. And it was only going to cause problems. So in verse 12, we also see that Peter withdrew himself. He separated himself from the saved Gentiles. So at this point, we notice the next thing that's worth mentioning. The tragedy of fearing man is isolation, the loss of fellowship. You lose out on Christian fellowship as you start to cut away and say, well, they're not really holy because they... They let the guys in that church grow their hair long, cut them out, right? Or the other church where they have a dress code. And so if they don't have the same dress code, they're not really Christians. And you just keep cutting people out of the fold and out of the body of Christ. Eventually, you're the only church that worships God in the whole world, right? That's how you end up feeling and sensing because you, you isolate yourself. You withdraw from other Christians. 
we're a body of believers that is full of different ethnic groups, full of different culture backgrounds from different places in career paths, right? There's no economic tier here of you have to make this much to come to this church or you have to make below this much, right? It's, we're a church. Anyone can come just as they are. You guys remember that old song, Come Just As You Are? And that one should be just always in your brain every time the Lord leads you to preach the gospel and you look at that person and you're like, them? <laughs> yes, let them come as they are. You isolate yourself when you live by the laws of man or by the laws of Moses or whoever. You end up isolating yourself. As a Christian, one of the best things that we enjoy is the family of believers, the body that blesses one another. Now, some of you probably don't have the best experience with family, uh, so I won't talk about it as a family. Let's talk about it as a body. If you lose a part of your body, the rest of you hurts. If a part of your body isn't working correctly, your whole body hurts, right? Every time your back hurts, eventually your feet start to hurt because they're connected. Or when your feet hurt, your back hurts, right? Every time you have a cold, it's draining in the ears, your nose is all messed up, and you have a little thing in your throat, right? Your whole body gets affected every time. And in the same way as Christians in a church, when one part of the body suffers, the rest of the body suffers. I was reminded of a verse that someone shared this morning during prayer time that we are called to mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. That's what the body does. We're here for each other. We take pleasure in blessing one another. When me and Nikki arrived here a year and a half ago, two years ago, we were blessed so much. People were like, oh, you're new, you're young, you're married. Here's $100. And I was like, oh, thank you. I, I'll put it away. Thank you. It was very shocking to me. I'd never been blessed like that by people I didn't know yet. But they wanted to bless me. Somebody else, when we got into our apartment, they bought us a microwave. We were like, oh, thank you. You know, it was just people were blessing us. Same for you guys. When someone's struggling, you can come alongside. When someone needs emotional support, you can be there for them. You can be the body as you take heart and pleasure in blessing one another. And on that same note, um, just in the moment, I feel the Lord telling me to say this. There are some people in our church who are struggling financially. And I'm not asking for any money. But if you are led by God, then come talk to me, and I can hook you up with that right person who needs the help because they need help. Sometimes it's legal matters or they lost their job or whatever happens. But we can be there for each other financially, emotionally, spiritually, we can love one another, okay? Don't isolate yourselves with legalism. Peter isolated himself, and look where it got him, in trouble. <laughs> he, uh, he couldn't live up to his own ideals. He couldn't live up to their ideals. The fear of man isolates you, but faith in Christ brings unity in the church. The fear of God creates a family. Verse 13, it says, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, before them all. In verse 13, we see the next tragedy of fearing man, and it's the influence of others. It's the fact that you are going to negatively influence others when you are fearing men. Peter was a leader. He was a man of God. People respected him. They looked up to him. But when he fell short and started doing the wrong thing, people followed him. Uh, one commentary put it like dominoes. They said, uh, as Peter fell like a domino, each one fell after him so that even Barnabas was taken away. Barnabas was called alongside Paul to preach to the Gentiles. He went on mission trips with Paul to the Gentile area. And yet even he was pulled aside. When we fear man rather than fearing God, and we start to live by that, our influence in others, we're not going to be a blessing anymore. We're not going to be a blessing anymore. We're going to end up hurting people. We're going to end up putting them down, affecting them negatively. It plays a part in our witness to the unsaved. As Christians, we're constantly influencing those around us. Now, do we want people to know us because we follow certain rules? Or do we want people to know us because we believe in Jesus? 
When they ask you about your church, do you want to start with, oh, this is what you're not allowed to do? This is what you are allowed to do? This is what you're supposed to dress when you come? No. And they say, hey, what's your church like? Oh, man, we focus on Jesus. We worship him and him alone. That's what we want to be known for. It'll affect our witness. It'll affect the way you raise your kids, the way you treat your siblings, the way you befriend people. It'll negatively influence them if you fear men. Lastly, in verse 13, it says that they are carried away into hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. That's the last tragedy of fearing man that we see here at least. Peter was denying his own beliefs in order to please men. He was regressing and backsliding in his own faith and his own liberties. It led him to say one thing in one place and something else in a different place. So inevitably, if you live by the laws of society or men or try to please everybody around you, you're going to end up being a hypocrite. You act one way at church, but then when you're at work, you're a different person. You act one way at church, but then when you're at home with friends, you're a different person. If you fear men, you'll, you'll fall into that peer pressure, right? When you cover up your liberties, sometimes it's a blessing for their, like I said, for a weaker Christian, other times, it's because you're afraid of men and you end up being a hypocrite. When you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, you guys know this, you were given the liberty from even the best intended rules in a church. We want you to walk by faith and to grow in your faith. So if you live to please people, you'll end up becoming a hypocrite. Those are the four tragedies. A loss of liberty, isolation, negatively influencing others, hypocrisy. That's what happens when you fear man. But when you fear God, you're not as much like Peter. You're a little bit more like Paul. So let's get into that. What is it like to fear God rather than fearing man? Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That was Proverbs 1, 7. The first thing we see in verse 14 is that Paul points out the double standard and the hypocrisy of the legalists. They'll always ask for more than they can live up to themselves. By Peter's actions, he was perpetuating this false notion that the Gentiles were second-class Christians, that they had to convert to Judaism before they became Christians. But Peter hadn't always thought that way. So Paul would have been right up in front of Peter and saying, which is it, Peter? Is it we can eat what we want and we can be friends with Cornelius? Or is it that they have to live like Jews? Which, what do you... What is it, Peter? Right? You're double-minded. The first blessing of living in fear of God is that we have healthy correction and rebuke in a godly church that doesn't fear men. Healthy correction. Blessed rebuke. If a church is more focused, if a family is more focused on pleasing people, then they won't say anything if you're in sin. They won't say something if you're living a false life. If you're more focused on pleasing that person and gaining their approval, then you're not going to ruffle any feathers, right? You're not going to rock the boat. Just let them be who they are. Oh, that's just, you know, that's just Bill, right? He's just a jerk sometimes, right? That's just, that's just, uh, I can't think of any random names at the top of my head. Um, somebody throw out a name. What was that? Phil. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Uh, that's just Phil. He just cusses a lot, right? Though that's just him. No, Phil doesn't curse. If we just accept people as they are like that, then nobody ever starts to become more like Christ. If there's no healthy rebuke, then there's, the church is just a club, right? What do you do as parents for your children? Do you tell them right from wrong? You tell them right from wrong. You tell them who they are in Christ and who they're not. Because the world is constantly going to try to tell them who they ought to be or that they should just pretend to be anything, right? And just figure out what they want to be. As parents, as a youth pastor, right? When we teach the youth, as older siblings or even younger siblings to your older brother or sister in Christ or by blood, if there's not healthy rebuke because you're too afraid and you just want to keep their approval, no one's going to grow. People will be left in sin for however long. There has to be healthy rebuke. If Paul feared Peter, or what people would say, he wouldn't have said anything. But he feared God. And so he spoke up about right and wrong. Think of all the parents that don't discipline their children. What do their kids turn out to be? Just the rambunctious, 
crazy, we can't control them kind of kids, right? Because they weren't taught right from wrong. Think of all the heretics who preach a false gospel. But if somebody had just said, hey, brother, that's not true. Let me talk with you about that. Then half those cults wouldn't have been started, right? There has to be healthy rebuke. The fear of God prevents evil from spreading with a healthy rebuke, healthy correction. Verse 15, it says, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. <clears throat> for one thing, in verse 15, when he says Jews by nature versus sinners like the Gentiles, Paul's being slightly sarcastic. He's trying to prove a point. He's trying to give him the, the idea. He says, hey, you know, we're Jews by nature. Remember, we were born, saved, and we weren't sinners like them, right, Peter? But even we figured out, even we believed that we have to believe to be saved. We have to find faith in Jesus, not the works of the flesh. That's what he's trying to get across to Peter's mind, right? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ, even we, even us, us privileged ones, us Jewish people, we have to have faith in Jesus. And so the next thing we see here, the fear of God brings salvation. When you fear God, you find faith in Jesus because of what he did for you. You realize your sin. You realize your shame. You realize what's wrong in the world. And so you choose to serve God and not sin. You choose to walk by faith in Jesus and not in the works of the law. It changes everything. When you fear God and you place your faith in him and you find approval in God, you find salvation. Paul's trying to settle the story, right? He's trying to set the story straight about what's right, what's wrong. And the first thing we need to see, the second thing we see here is that we're not justified by works, but by faith. And that fear of God, rather than the fear of man, it's what saves us. Verse 17, but if we, or excuse me, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? In this verse, Paul's pointing out the backwardness of Peter's thoughts, right? Wait, Jesus said we had liberty. Jesus called us out of the law, but yet now if we are guilty because we don't follow the law, doesn't that mean Jesus led us into sin, right? Peter, don't you understand? For the same thing goes for us. If we try to live by the law, but yet say we're saved by grace, then we're saying that God has really led us into sin, right? I can't do this. I have to do that. I, I'm supposed to believe this, but not believe that. It's one or the other. Either Jesus said it's by grace or he didn't. We can trust where God leads us, right? We can trust where he leads us and he leads us into salvation, into freedom, not into sin. So the third blessing that comes from fearing God is that we can trust him. We can trust him with everything, everything in our lives. Verse, excuse me, Proverbs 25, verse 29 says this, the fear of man brings a snare or a trap. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. We trust in the Lord. My faith is in the Lord because I fear him. My finances are in God's hands. My friendships are in God's hands. The people that I love who are sick or hurting or who are going through tragedy, the, the, the ministry that we do, it's all in God's hands. I trust him where he leads me. He doesn't lead me into sin and into the law. He leads me into freedom. We trust in God. If he was leading us into something backwards, saying, come out of the law, but yet you're still guilty of it, well, then we couldn't trust him, could we? But we trust in the Lord. It's such a blessing to trust God. Verse 19, or excuse me, 18. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to Christ. If we recreate the law either Moses' law or some new one modernized for 2018, then what we're doing is we're actually sinning. We think we're trying to be holy by putting rules and perimeters about what's sin and what's not, 
but we end up just hurting people. We end up sinning. We end up transgressors. Paul said, if I recreate it, then I'm doubling back. I'm backsliding. I'm doing what's wrong. I'm redoing, reestablishing what God tore down. We're set free from the prison of sin. If you were set free from prison and then you went home and built a prison and locked yourself up, are you really free? No, you've gone home and put yourself back into bondage. If we recreate the law, we put ourselves back where we used to be. But remember, if you weren't, if you're not a Jew, if you were born a Gentile like most of us in the room, then you were never under that law. So why start living by it now? In verse 19, we see it says, For through the law I died to the law that I might live to God. The law condemns us to death, every one of us. It puts us all in a place where we ought to die for our sins, that we've broken God's commands, right? If you live to appease, appease that law, you'll never do it. In fact, by the time you start trying to live by the law, you'll have already have failed, but the law did require a few things, and that's why Jesus came. He said he came to fulfill the law of Moses and to bring grace, to bring truth and grace. The next thing that we see here, the last thing that we see here, is that the blessing of fearing God is the death of the flesh. We put to death our sinful nature, who we used to be. Because you fear God and you have faith in Jesus, you'll be able to set aside all the things that held you back. You don't need the law and the rules to make you holy. You need God's spirit in you so that you can walk by faith. Does that make sense to everybody? You don't need the law that tells you what to do and what not to do. You need the spirit of God in you guiding you from right from wrong and into holy things. The scripture says, thou shalt not lie, right? But it doesn't say, thou shalt not lie and here's how not to. The law didn't give us a way out. It just said what not to do. But Jesus said, Come unto me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Walk with me. I'll get you through this life. I'll show you how to be like me. The law leaves us hanging, but Christ hung for us. He died. And he resurrected. That's what Paul finishes with. He, after this culmination of, I'm an apostle, and can't you just believe the gospel that I'm preaching? And, and Peter, what have you done? You've been living in sin. You, you led people astray. He ends with saying, and, and, and I don't set the grace of God aside. He loved me. He gave himself up for me, and I don't set God's grace aside. That's what sustains me. That's what I live by. Because if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Literally what he's saying is he's saying, if Jesus didn't need to die, then why did he die? It's worthless. But what did Jesus say in the garden? He said, Father, if there is any other way, let this cup pass. Still let your will be done. And what happened? There was no other way. Jesus went to the cross. He died for our sins. He loved me and he gave himself for me. And that, that's something you can, you can write on your... And you put, a, put it on a bumper sticker, put it in your phone as your backdrop. Every day, every day you open your phone, you should see where it says, He loved me and He gave Himself for me. We don't live in fear of man. I have to be honest. I'm going to confess something to you guys as a church. I'm very fearful at times about what is the church going to do? What are they going to think? What are they going to say? When Pastor Rob leaves, are they all going to leave too, right? There's that feeling that comes every once in a while. I should teach like this, or I should do things like that so that they enjoy church, so that they keep coming back. That thought comes, but I don't live by that. I have to live by what God says. So if you don't like what's going on at this church, then sorry. <laughs> I'm being led by the Lord. That's why we have that new mission statement. That's why we're in this book. That's why we do things the way we do. The Lord is leading this church. We don't do it out of the fear of men. Even if that voice comes and lies to me sometimes, I, I, I've, by God's grace, I've been able to set it aside for the last eight, what is it, August? Yeah, the last eight months. <laughs> Just set it aside. We set aside the things of the flesh. We set aside the law. We walk by faith. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are and for your grace that saves us. We thank you for your love, that you would give yourself up out of your love, God. Thank you that you've set aside the law, that we don't have to live by that anymore, and that we don't have to live in the fear of men, 
like Peter had that lapse of judgment, that moment of weakness. Lord, if we feared men, we wouldn't be at church today. Lord, if we feared men, we wouldn't raise the children in this church to walk with Jesus. Lord, if we feared men, we wouldn't share the gospel. So help us to not fear men and to want the approval of people, but to only seek your approval, God, by faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for being satisfied in his work on the cross and in our faith in Jesus, Lord. It's, it's, it's more than we could ever ask. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.